Good morning. Um, I have this is JP Salibi, and this is for our fourth annual functional medicine symposium. And I have the honor and privilege of uh, having a chat today with Dr. Robert Bobby Pearl. And um, I'm going to let him kind of introduce himself a little bit and give you a little bit of his bio since it's pretty uh, expansive. Bobby? It's great to be here. And uh, so I am a physician. I'm really on my third career. I spent the first piece as a practicing reconstructive plastic surgeon, fixing children with cleft lip and cleft palate. Uh, then I was the CEO of the Permanente Medical Group, which is the delivery half of Kaiser Permanente. And after doing being CEO for 18 years, I have published two books, uh, One Mistreated, why we think we're getting good healthcare, why we're usually wrong and, and uncaring, how the culture of medicine kills doctors and patients. Profits from both books go to Doctors Without Borders. This is really a passion and a love of mine. I also teach at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and Stanford Medical School. I have two podcasts, one of which is Fixing Healthcare. They'll be starting a new season with the head of the AMA as our first guest in the season six and also coronavirus, the truth with updates on what's happening relative to that infection. And as you noted in my book, I asked my friends to call me Robbie. And so let's get rid of the formalities and you can use Robbie throughout the rest of the interview. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, most of my staff at the office called me by my initials JP. So I, I get that. Um, uh, Robbie, tell us a little bit about your first book and what was the, uh, the energy behind that and what prompted you to write that one? The first book looked at the failures of the systems of American medicine. Having been the CEO for 18 years, I was well aware of them. There's a broken insurance system that rewards doctors simply for doing more, not for doing better. Uh, it was a fragmented care uh, delivery structure with doctors working relatively independently. It used technology left over from the last century. No, actually from the century before, because the most common way doctors exchange information in the United States is the fax machine, an 1834 invention. And there was no structure, no logic. And so I wrote the book and I had hopes that the, war, the United States would evolve. And lo and behold, three, four years later, not much was very different. In fact, December 2019, two months before the coronavirus comes ashore, the federal government releases a report that says that healthcare is gonna rise five to 6% a year, every year for the next decade. And when you do the math, the compound interest, that's 2.5 trillion more dollars on top of 3.7 trillion. I waited. I wanted to hear from doctors, from medical societies saying, this is absurd. We could use 2.5 trillion in so many great ways, whether it was around prevention, management of chronic disease, social determinants of health. We can go to an entire list, but simply to continue doing things the way we were doing them and expect that the American populace could pay for them seemed to me to be foolish. And so I researched this whole notion of when illogical things happen, the basis is usually cultural. And that's what I discovered in this new book that yes, the system is broken, but it's like that caduceus with those two snakes intertwined around the staff. The system and the culture work together in ways that can both create tremendous value and doctors can be heroes, but it also can harm and kill both doctors and patients. Great. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. The, uh, the second book on the culture really uh, hit, hit some notes with me. Um, tell me a little bit about your experience. In the first book, you wrote about an experience with the hospital in Sweden. Can you make some comparisons for the audience about what you discovered there? 
although the first book was about the system, the second about the culture, at this point, I sort of would combine them together. And Sweden is a great example of a nation that has both a very different system of healthcare delivery and a very different culture. So if you look at the United States and you ask in medicine, you know, what do we value? Culture is about you, what you value, what you believe, the norms that you follow, you know, what do we value as doctors? We value abilities left over from the 20th century. What do I mean by that? How do we pick medical students? How do we select residencies? It's really based upon this ability to memorize 10,000 or 100,000 arcane facts. I mean, how often do you use the Krebs cycle in your day-to-day -day work and yet you got tested on that 17 times? But it was important in the 20th century. Why was that? If you wanted to carry all of medical knowledge with you, you need a 50 pound backpack filled with textbooks. Today we have the smartphone. What is important in the 20th century is less important in the 21st. What do we value? We value the ex personal experience and the judgment of doctors. What is that we don't value enough? Evidence-based medicine. We know that there are many ways now to take care of problems that we didn't know before. And in this way, Sweden was ahead of us. When I went there, I went with Don Berwick, the head of the IHI, and we watched as they achieved results that were dramatically better than the United States at far lower cost. And when they, they did it by coming together as doctors and asking themselves, okay, what's the best way to take care of this problem? And when they sorted that out amongst themselves, they all followed it. Getting that done in the United States is next to impossible. I talk about hypertension. Hypertension across the United States is controlled 55 to 60% of the time. It's the number one cause of strokes, a major contributor to heart disease, major contributor to kidney failure. When I was CEO in Kaiser Permanente, we controlled it 90%. Now we had good doctors, but the United States has great doctors. We had good medicines. The United States has great medicines. What was it that was different? Two things. Some about the system, it was capitated. So we valued prevention as much as intervention. We had technology, we shared a common electronic health record, but it was a culture that elevated prevention, avoidance of complications from chronic disease, teamwork, collaboration, cooperation. These are not the traditional values and so Sweden was able at far lower cost to achieve better outcomes because not only was the system better, but also the culture. Um, do you think there is some kind of confirmation bias in play when it comes to uh, developing guidelines? I mean, we talk about ev evidence-based medicine, but sometimes the evidence that we have uh, in front of us is 20, you know, two decades old, 20 years old. It's very slow to change. I sort of had practiced for about 15 years in emergency medicine. And then I kind of segued into my, my second career in functional and integrative medicine. I look at guidelines, but also I'm developing them as I go. I mean, I'm looking at five and 10 articles every morning over my coffee of things just out in the peer review literature, and I'm kind of adapting that to my practice. It's very hard to kind of cookbook it sometimes when you have these outlier patients, and that's what uh, I see a lot of is folks that aren't getting better elsewhere. They're kind of coming to me after being seen by 15 practitioners. So these outliers are sometimes hard to, to follow certain guidelines or, or a certain cookbook. Um, so can you comment a little bit about that? Um, sure, I think you're really, raising two or three excellent questions. First one, confirmation bias we know exists. Danny Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for doing it. You know, when we have a belief in something, we find the evidence that supports it. And it takes, according to the Rand Institute, 17 years for a really great idea to become common practice. And we can talk some about that in the book. I talk about Ignaz Semmelweis, who showed that if uh, doctors would dip their hands in the chlorinated water and take off the leather aprons that they wore filled with blood and pus when they went from the autopsy room to the delivery room, they could lower maternal mortality from 18% to the 2%. And he published the data and nothing changed because doctors just couldn't accept culturally that they were the source of infection, 
You look at people like uh, Herman Borhov, who met Fahrenheit, learned about the thermometer, and it'd be a hundred years before the thermometer was used in medicine because the idea that the doctor's hands discerning temperature was not the ultimate seemed culturally impossible. So these kinds of things happen for a combination, confirmation bias and uh, culture sitting in play. Uh, what you're describing is that medicine is an evolving field and we have to always be aware of that. But to me, it's resolved not by every individual look, trying to understand the data. There's way too much information. It's groups of doctors coming together, talking about things and then coming up with the best practice. And if an individual wants to deviate, that's fine, but you should document why. Well, I don't believe that a blood pressure of 150 is bad for you. I don't believe that COVID actually kills people. Well, we have some data that shows those points may not be accurate. If you want to say, you know, I think it's more dangerous in a rare case of hypoglycemia than it is from elevated blood sugar, that's a judgment. That's not science. You know, you want to risk one life against multiple lives, a clear tragedy in the short term against multiple in the long term. That's a different question of how do you apply the data. But we should be able to agree on the data. And we actually never come together and doing that. The third part, and again, I talk about it in the book. Uh, I talk about a particular patient where I went against the recommended evidence base, everything I've been taught, but it was the exception. And to me, that's the key word that you're saying, which is if most of the time you're following the exception, you're probably not practicing very good medicine. Most of the time, is there 10, 20, 30%, 40% of our profession that is subjective, possibly? And we need to recognize that and learn from it and evolve it as we're doing now in COVID. But is there 60, 70% where consistency is better than variation? That's been proven. And yet we don't value that in that 60 to 70 or 80%. You know, in writing the book, one of the points I wanted to make is culture is neither good nor bad. It allowed our doctors to be incredibly heroic during COVID-19 to go to the ED and take care of patients when they didn't have the protective gear they needed. And they'd don uh, garbage bags without gowns, place of gowns and salad lids in place of masks. It, it's a tremendous culture. And yet it's that same culture that creates some problems. Is the systemic issues 80%, 60%, 40%? I can't put an exact number on it. But as long as there are things under our control, the fact that the culture, the system is problematic, doesn't excuse us, in my view, from also addressing the cultural issues at the same time, this second snake of the caduceus. You mentioned uh, Dr. Summerweiss, and I'm a big fan. Uh, my wife and I traveled to uh, Budapest a few years ago, and I made it a point to hunt down his museum and visit it. Uh, and I was a little bit disturbed at the fact that there were hardly any, any people in there visiting. It was a little dusty and old. I, I don't know if you, uh, Robbie have been to it before, but it's, uh, you know, for a guy who had such a big impact on the health of women and saving hundreds and thousands of lives with uh, his process uh, to have a museum so overlooked, it was, it was a little bit sad for me, but, um, you know, I, you know, I, I'd like to um, uh, ask you, are you familiar with Dr. Gil Welsh, H. Gilbert, Gilbert Welsh? He wrote a book, Less Medicine, More Health, no, nope. um, no. Okay. That's a good read. I have my, my folks at the Academy try to read that. It's great on sometimes how we overdo things in medicine and that contributes to the rising healthcare costs. Um, what do you see as some distractions in, in our society right now, in our culture right now that are getting, are keeping us from solving some of the problems that you outlined in your uh, second book? Sure. So again, we have to start with the systemic issues that are there. They are very real. And doctors are running up every single day against bureaucratic tasks and prior authorization and a clunky computer system that literally comes with them and the patients. The systemic issues certainly stand in the way and they're frustrating. And doctors feel as though they don't have the time to provide the care. You know, what we know is that uh, doctors spend as much time 
filling administrative paperwork out and documenting uh, reimbursement claims as they do in providing direct care. And this is very frustrating if you've dedicated a decade of your life to providing the care. But there are a lot of things I would say that are also inside the culture and under our control that we just need to do better. How we view primary care to me is a big example. You know, the data shows that primary care physicians, adding 10 primary care physicians to a community increases life expectancy, longevity, two and a half times more than 10 specialists. And in medicine, we elevate the specialists, we elevate the interventional cardiologist who unblocks the coronary arteries above the primary care physician who prevents occlusion in far more patients that are there. You know, in, in medicine, uh, what we know, the Mayo Clinic did the study, 30% of what we do add no, adds no value. Standing in the way of the economics, because, uh, well, take a good example. The number one operation done by orthopedic surgeons is knee arthroscopy with cartilage trimming. If you do a sham operation, double blind study, you make your incision, you don't insert a scope, you just close the skin a year later, you can't tell the difference in the two groups. And yet it's the most commonly done operation in orthopedics. But the question really becomes, how does the culture contribute? Because it's not just the economics, it's that we have trouble as doctors admitting when we can't do things. We have trouble saying there's not much more we can do. We're sorry about that. There are limitations. These are the cultural pieces. We have a lot of repression and denial. I'm very worried in the post COVID era that we're gonna have a PTSD um, major problem with doctors. I talked to one doctor who lost four patients in one day. How do you deal with that? You know, we had learned repression and denial for the occasional death once, twice in a year. So for some doctors, maybe once or twice in their career, depending upon their specialty. And yet now we're facing a situation where it's happening every single day. And we have a culture that says, never admit you're weak, never admit the pain, never ask for help, never say you need help, don't show emotions. These were the learnings we'd had as residents that are simply continuing today. This is the, I call it the double whammy that we face, a set of systemic problems and a set of cultural values and beliefs, a need for oppression and denial that is now not appropriate in the 20th, first century, in the 21st century. Let me add one other thing that I think is contributing, which is that there's been a real change in the patient that we have not acknowledged in our medical school training or in our residency training. You know, in the 20th century, when there was not the smartphone you could carry, when there was not an internet, doctors had almost all the knowledge. Patients came and there was this massive gap and we had a uh, patriarchal kind of way of the doctor knows best. And I say patriarchal because Men were the dominant physicians of the time. Patients now come having gone to the internet. We may say that's bad data. You shouldn't be looking at it as bad information. That's not how patients see it. They see themselves now as knowledgeable, maybe not as much as the doctor, but the doctor's not the ultimate authority. The doctor brings a lot of expertise and we don't like that. That lowers our status in the hierarchy that exists. We're in a consumer era. Doctors hate the idea that patients are, in quotes, consumers, but that's what they are. They use their apps on their phone to book travel, to order things through retail. We don't like that. We like our offices. You know, what do we call that area just inside the door? It's the waiting room. Your job as a patient is to wait. That's the, it's not an educational area, welcome area. Why did telemedicine take the coronavirus pandemic to become so available to patients? We know it's more convenient, often provides a quicker diagnosis, saves costs because it goes against the culture of medicine, what we value, we elevate our offices, we elevate the skills that got us in the medical school and residency. And I think it's harming not just patients, but physicians as well. And your focus on wellness is so vital because I think right now medicine is not a well profession. Some of it is inflicted on us by the broken system, but some of it I believe we do to ourselves.
Yeah, in, in 2013, when I opened my clinical practice, we embraced telemedicine quite rapidly. So we've been doing, we had the platforms in place. Prior to COVID uh, pandemic, we were doing about 40% telemed. Of course, during the pandemic lockdown, we went up to about 70%. So, I mean, it was good for us in that we didn't have to kind of reinvent our office. It was already in place. One thing that our uh, organization has uh, a focus on is, is medical education. And as I look back at my years, and I'm sure when you look back at yours, there are some things you cringe about, <laughs> like I do, about things we had to go, uh, you know, hoops we had to jump through. Uh, can you comment a little bit about if you had uh, the power, if you were king for the day, how you would change medical education, what you would do to, to make it different or better? There's so much that I would do differently, but I'll offer you uh, three thoughts. Uh, the first one goes back to what I said about what we value. It's we should be requiring that students bring their smartphone to every exam. They're going to have the smartphone with them in the uh, care delivery areas. Why should they have it on their exams? Uh, we should be focusing not on the arcane facts to memorize, but how do you access them and utilize them and then apply them? You know, it's interesting when you think about something like chronic disease, you know, we say, oh, that's easy. We have an algorithm. We have a a checklist to follow. Yeah, that's true. But do patients always follow it? Our measure needs to be how effective we are at making the change happen. And as doctors, we don't like that because now we're dependent upon the patient to take the action. We want to define our job as providing the information. No, the real measure of that is going to be, did we earn the trust, the confidence to be able to get the change to happen? And that is far more difficult than certainly memorizing. So that's the first thing I would change. The second thing I would change is I would have a lot of the lectures delivered by primary care physicians. You know, if you, by the end of the first year, every medical student understands the hierarchy with the specialist at the top and primary care at the bottom. And why shouldn't they? You know, the heart was taught by the cardiologist and the intestines were taught by the GI doctor and the brain was taught by the neurologist. Why shouldn't the primary care physician who has enough knowledge in all these areas be able to explain them to a first year medical student just as well? Maybe the seminar for the cardiology fellow is taught by the cardiologist, but I would be elevating the primary care physician's role and expanding it because right now medicine is fragmented. Who coordinates it all? On my podcast, I had a woman with a terminal breast cancer who was talking about all the doctors that she saw. She was someone who's run multi-million dollar companies and she couldn't keep all this information straight. How's the typical patient going to do that? We need to have someone who's going to become, in my mind, the quarterback of the team. And that's primary care, which is an inverse of uh, where we are today. And the last thing I would do is I would short medical school by a year. I think the fourth year right now has become, at least pre-COVID, a year of travel and residencies and a few uh, electives. I think we can use that year better. I think students could spend it in a business school, learning to create teams and be able to educate others better. They could spend it in community clinics, learning about all the social determinants of health. They could spend it in other countries, studying other healthcare systems. They could spend it earlier in their residency rather and finish a bit earlier and be able to contribute back sooner. Those are just three, I would say, of the dozens of ideas that I have. Again, the Flexner Report came out, what, 1920 or something? I'm not sure that medical education is that much different now than it was a full century ago. Right. I look at Germany when I was a res first year resident, I had a couple of German exchange students and they start their medical education right out of high school. And it's a six year program. Matter of fact, one I became very good friends with, and we attended each other's weddings years later. Uh, he got two degrees. He got a dental degree. He did uh, dental uh, plastic surgery and his medical degree. So he had two degrees that he obtained in six years out of high school. So yeah, sometimes our laborious uh, process of four years and four 
Now, our academy sees a lot of uh, students or attendees that are uh, advanced providers, uh, nurse practitioners, both adult and family and uh, physician's assistants, which I, I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the nomenclature change now with, I just want to depart on this for a second, physician assistants, they're now referring them to as physician associates. So, and there, there's some pushback with uh, some of the medical societies about that. Uh, but, um, but I think, yeah, you're right. Uh, I think the medical education system's too long, it's too drawn out. Why, why do we have to take biochemistry twice, undergraduate and then in medical school, same with micro, et cetera. Um, and I also believe you're, you're, I go along with the fact that a lot of the lectures should be delivered by primary care doctors. We refer to ourselves as super generalists. Maybe we need to change the title, make it more exciting. So a generalist or GP or a PCP, that may be kind of dull. But when we tell our patients who want to see us for other things, well, yeah, come to us for other things other than your thyroid condition or whatever. And we refer to ourselves as super generalists. So they leave the office with some hope that, well, maybe we can tackle some of their other issues. Um, just to wrap up, uh, Robbie, on our, our discussion today, could you vaticinate a little bit about the future of healthcare and maybe end this on a more positive note? What do you think is going to happen and um, in, in, a, in a positive, positive way? Yeah. L let me comment upon something you said about the changing nomenclature for nurse practitioners and physician assistants and, and others. This is well explained in the book because this has to do with whether the hierarchy is very vertical or flattened. Uh, that's what's really being debated. Yes, there's money involved, and I don't want to people to think there's not, but you know something? We have a massive shortage of primary care physicians in the United States. There's no shortage of work for primary care docs to do. So what should be the battle? It has to do with where people are in the hierarchy. And the reality is that to some extent, the money you earn reflects your status, but I think to even a larger extent, your status reflects the money that you get paid. But let's look forward because I think it will tie into a lot of the things we've talked about today. You know, I teach at the Stanford Graduate School of Business as well as the medical school. And so I, I focus a lot on finance. We're gonna come out of this pandemic as a nation, I believe with a lot of economic challenges. There's a lot of debate about this. The stock market's doing well, but if you look at the federal government, we will have borrowed $8 trillion. We have to repay with interest. States by law have to have balanced budgets and even states like California with Amazon, uh, sorry, with uh, Apple and with Netflix and Google and Facebook, they're facing economic shortfalls as unemployment stays high and Medicaid goes up. And finally, you have the small businesses. These are the backbone of employment in the United States. And they either went out of business or they've suffered quite a bit. I think we're going to see a tremendous downward pressure on the cost of healthcare. This $2.5 trillion, I think, is not going to be able to be paid for by our nation. And we're going to face two choices. We can ration care. Say you're too old for surgery, the drug's just too expensive, uh, or in some other way, find the haves and have nots to lower cost. I think that would be terrible. I think that would be insulting to the culture that we chose to first do no harm to people. I think it will create even more moral injury that exists today. And at the other end, what we can do is to evolve the healthcare system. And I believe that that's where we need to go. And it's what ties the two books together. Because I think we need to be capitated and reward value, not volume. But I also know that when you do that, culture evolves. Why do I say that? Because when you paid prepaid for the care and keeping people healthy, you value prevention, avoidance of complications from chronic disease, you value patient safety. You offer tools like you did uh, with telemedicine sitting in play. You do the things I think that start to align the values of the patients with the values of the clinician. Second of all, you have to move towards an integrated structure. You can't deliver great care in the 21st century, particularly the patients with chronic disease, isolated alone. It's a team effort. And it may be coordinated by the primary care physician, but everyone needs to be involved. Hypertension control, part of why we could do it in Kaiser Permanente is when doctors saw a specialist. I'm a specialist. I don't know what to do for the hypertension, but I can recognize it and I can point it out and bring it to the attention of primary care to address it. 
We need technology that works. What do we value in the culture of medicine? Robots and proton accelerators. No, we need to value the tools that actually improve the health of patients. And then finally, we need to have a structure to organize and deliver this care. And that goes against the history of medicine where the idea of coming together in a way to raise quality and lower cost is not something that we've been willing to, I'll say, give up some of the complete autonomy to be able to do it in ways that benefit patients. You know, I'll summarize it all with an experience I had at the Oregon Health Service building. I walked in the door, this was a little while ago, and there across the top, it said quality, service, cost, and along the bottom, it said, pick any two. That's the mindset of the 20th century when we didn't have the technology, we didn't have the medical knowledge, we didn't have the opportunities of today. I believe we can do all three. And I loved your example about the telehealth because in the right set of problems, not everything, we can make a diagnosis immediately. We can do it without the patient missing work, without having to take three buses to come to our office and we can do it at a far lower cost like yourself, I wrote an article in Health Affairs seven years ago, pointing out that at that time we did 12 million virtual visits, 12 million in Kaiser Permanente. And for six years, the world stayed at 1% until, tele, until coronavirus happened. There is so much I believe that we can do. I couldn't be more optimistic, but I recognize that standing in the way are two things, the system of medicine, the current one, and the culture of medicine, and I'm hopeful that through my book, through our conversation, that we will evolve both. I think what we will see is that some people will move forward and others will follow along. It won't be an easy journey. They'll go through the five stages of Kubler-Ross grief. There are, there'll be denial saying, no, I don't think we really have to change medicine. The United States medicine is the best in the world, even though there's not a shred of evidence it's true. Then they'll get angry with seeing that now in some of the moral injury conversations that are happening. Then they get a bargain. We see that now 50 to 70% of doctors work for hospitals and um, private equity firms and other places. Then we're gonna see them go into depression. We're certainly seeing a lot of that in medicine, but acceptance, not that medicine is the way we might like it to be or the way that it used to be, but it is the way it needs to be to address the world as it is around us. And when that happens, I believe that we once again can make American medicine the best in the world. Very good. Well, fantastic interview. And uh, just a word, a shout out to all the folks out there. Great book, Uncaring. Go get it, read it. And uh, we'll try to spread the word. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Robbie, uh, for joining so me much. today. It's been my pleasure. And uh, congratulations on the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.